The ramp worked. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 25th Charleston Festival. This evening, we're firmly on Sussex University territory. Charleston and Sussex University have a great deal in common. The university's wonderful archives hold a rich repository of Bloomsbury material, including the Monk's House Papers and the Leonard Wolfe Papers. My father, Quentin Bell, was invited by his old friend, Sussex University's second vice-chancellor, Asa Briggs, to become its first professor of history and theory of art between 1967 and 1975, after which my father became the founding chairman of the Charleston Trust. So it won't surprise you to learn that the University of Sussex has very generously sponsored this event. Thank you so much. And thank you too to a very good friend of Charleston who is chairing this evening's event, Sussex University's present Vice-Chancellor, Professor Michael Farthing, far left. Joining him on the platform today is the aforesaid Asa Briggs, Baron Briggs of Lewis. Much more than a pioneering Vice-Chancellor, Asa is one of our foremost historians. And as he's now nearly, nine, sorry, actually 93 years old, I'd be here all day if I were to try to list his books and achievements. However, we hope very much that in the next hour, he'll be telling us something about those himself, since his new book, Loose Ends and Extras, is the latest in a series of memoirs. Talking to him this evening is one of Britain's foremost novelists and screenwriters, Ian McEwan. Now, I would take a bet that everyone in this extremely well-read audience could name at least four of Ian's books or films, so I'm not going to underrate anyone's knowledge by listing his authorial achievements. For today's purposes, it's enough to say that for the setting of Ian's most recent novel, Sweet Tooth, he has returned to his old alma mater, the place where, back in 1970, he gained a BA in English literature, you've guessed it, Sussex University. So having, I hope, established that connection extremely firmly in your minds, let me hand over to Michael Farthing. Well, good, <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I think we're in for a treat. Uh, Asa celebrated his 93rd birthday last week in the traditional style, glass of champagne followed by a glass of whiskey or two. Um, he had a very special lunch on that day. And I think you took the day off, actually. But Asa works most, most days of the week. Uh, some of you will know that um, since uh, about 2011, he's produced three books. Um, Ian's only produced two. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and we're going to be talking about any of those books, should you wish, but we're particularly thinking about his most recent contribution to the memoir. And one of the things that uh, Asus said in, in the last book is that he always thinks in threes, omnium trium perfectum. So I'm going to just hand over to Asa, who's going to start the discussion this afternoon by saying a few words about Charleston. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, that's the first thing. But um, I would like to say that my connection with Charleston goes back before, in fact, the Charleston Festival started. And I do remember having lunch here with Clive Bell uh, and I was so glad to I'm being, um, I was introduced tonight by Quentin Bell's daughter. Um, I f find this a most interesting place, not only because of its connections with Bloomsbury, but because um, it used to be visited by uh, the, the Bells when they were living in Bloomsbury and therefore there's a direct connection between Bloomsbury and this place. 
Uh, I felt I had to say those words because I do regard it as being a very special honour to be speaking at the 25th anniversary of this festival. And uh, I'm proud of my own connection with it. That was what I wanted just to say at the beginning, uh, Michael, and I, I'm very happy to, of course, to have Ian sitting next to me. Well, thank you, Asa. Um, I think we've got a slight issue with the microphone. So do you want Asa to come forward? Doris, could you yeah. just... We don't have a radio mic. We don't have a radio mic, I don't think. Okay. You'll have to project. As, as many of you will have guessed, there's a riches of books outside, um, a lot of Ian's books and, and, and the three uh, books from Asa, um, the, this, the, the memoir. And um, they are, uh, Asa's memoirs are, are clearly those of a historian. Um, and they're written not in chronological order, they're written through a series of, of ideas, recollections. They're predominated by people that he's known. Um, and, and one of the people that features very strongly in, in, in the book is Lord Reith, John Reith, who we'll come back to a little bit later on. One of the um, features of, of, of Asa's writing and one of his concerns, I think, as a historian, and also very clear, I think, from Ian's writing, is that sometimes there's a very blurred margin between reality or fact and fiction. And Asa makes the point on, on a number of occasions that our recollections are not always correct. Two people can be in the same meeting and come away with a very, very different view of what was said or what was done or what we recall. And so, Ian, I don't know whether you'd just like to perhaps open the batting on how you think about that as a novelist, and then we'll get Asa just to begin to open up what it's like as a historian. Well, you're absolutely right about the engine of memory. Uh, it's weak, just like our sense of smell as, it, as biological entities. I don't think it was ever in, there was much evolutionary advantage in having a long memory. Uh, on the other hand, have an imagination as a way to foresee, anticipate future events may have fed into our ability to dream up non-existent things. At various times, I've found myself in document libraries researching a novel, fully aware that I'm crawling across, backwards and forwards, and sometimes along a border between what I'm going to imagine and what actually happened. And one of the pleasures, I think, of, of writing fiction is to merge these two completely thoroughly. I think it's the dream of those who attach themselves to realism in fiction to somehow, uh, with smoke and mirrors, put up enough in the way of artifice and enough in the way of shared and plausible reality that you can seduce your reader into thinking that what happened and that you've imagined is actually the case. So bringing real historical people, um, real historical events, changing them sometimes to fit <coughs> your purpose. I, I have to admit that even as I'm a, an empiricist at heart, I'm tempted to change things when they suit. Uh, this is one of the delights of, of this matter. I've sat, you must have done this as a, uh, um, I'm not sure it's there now. Up in the cupola of the Imperial War Museum, uh, there was a document library uh, full of um, letters, memoirs, journals, uh, often collected through the British Legion, or sometimes p things found in attics, from serving men and women and uh, civilians on the home front from the First and Second World Wars. Uh, extraordinary boxes that would be brought to your desk, you, you couldn't go into the stacks, brought to your desk, you'd open them and there would be uh, sometimes even a blood-stained, dirt-stained, crumpled envelope uh, 
one of which uh, always stuck in my mind. It was from a young lieutenant writing just as he was retreating from Belgium in 1940. The German army had swept across uh, through the Ardennes, uh, made a surprise uh, advance at something like 50 miles a day to the English Channel, one of the biggest, biggest routes the British Army had ever experienced. Everyone pushed uh, towards the beaches of Dunkirk. And amazing to me, uh, here was a letter, and he was posting it. Even as he said in his letter, Europe is going up in flames. This could be the end of civilization. The sense that all of Europe was falling under the grip of uh, Nazism. And he says to his fiance in this letter, go and see my father, borrow 80 guineas, and buy that little house we saw. <laughs> um, because all that will save us is ordinary life. Um, and it was just, it opened the past to me, um, that moment. And I used some of it, at least, and certainly its spirit in atonement, somewhat altered. But the craving for ordinariness, which also sparked in me a stab of guilt, because I've lived in peace and prosperity. And in the 60s, we were impatient with our parents' generation. Their love of ordinariness rather bored us. But they had stared into the abyss. So they didn't mind polishing their cars on a Sunday afternoon and all, do all the other things that drove us absolutely nuts. <laughs> because they had seen where we would never see, thank God. So it was a document like that, on that fact and fiction borderline, uh, that made huge inroads into my sense of how you could bring the past alive with something unpublished. I think myself that... Um... <laughs> I've often felt when I'm writing a book that I've been writing not a piece of history, but a novel. Really? Uh, and uh, I feel that this is particularly the case uh, with aspects of the book that I've just finished. Uh, why did I call it Loose Ends and Extras? An unusual title. Well, Loose Ends, I take from a broadcast program, uh, and I did know Ned Sherrin extremely well. And there's a fair amount about Ned Sherrin in my book. But also, I felt I ought to give myself the maximum degree of freedom, and then I, therefore I added the word, and extras. <laughs> Uh, so if I use the word extras, I can write about what I like. <laughs> um, I find that myself uh, in writing, um, I do spend, of course, an enormous amount of time in uh, places where records are kept. And I have worked indeed often in the Imperial War Museum under that cupola. Uh, I do feel, too, that one of the titles that I might have given to my book is that all things connect, because it is a very remarkable thing that the Imperial War Museum, where I spent so much time, was at one time the site of Bedlam. <laughs> and I've also written quite a bit about Bedlam. Uh, I like to have a diverse range of topics to write about. Uh, I've been drawn this time to some extent by centenaries. And uh, I note that, that one of my chapters in my book is called The Great War. I much prefer to call it The Great War still rather than The First World War. I think it was a very distinctive war. And uh, I have tried in that chapter to bring to life again some of the aspects of the uh, war. I was very fortunate indeed that my son Daniel, whom I'm glad to see sitting there before me, that my son Daniel drove me 
to France, which was quite an adventure for me in my present condition. And for the first time, I went under the Channel Tunnel. When we got there, I went to the Somme and the battles of the Somme, trying to, and the cemeteries associated with them. And we ended our journey at a little place on the Channel Coast called Olt. Nobody has ever heard of it. It was there uh, when I was a boy, and the people I stayed with, the family I stayed with, at a time when going to family, family holidays uh, was a real experience and not some collective act. Uh, I, when I went there, got there to Alt, I found it was exactly the same kind of channel as it had always been. But the town itself had changed almost totally. And I should say that we had the best meal in Ult that I had on the whole trip to the Somme because we had perfect oysters there. <laughs> and that's one thing that I have always liked very much indeed. Isa, are you ever tempted to um, sort of change history to suit your own thoughts or opinions? I mean, for instance, around people, you've got a big chapter in this book. You mentioned him before, but you've got a big chapter about John Reith, uh, yes. Lord Reith of the BBC. And I, I know Ian's quite interested in, in him as a character. So, I mean, I think you're very generous to, to Reith in the book, um, but not everybody, I think, had quite the same feelings about him. So how do you, how do you tackle the difficult parts about people? Well, I, I particularly, I got to know Reith extremely well, probably as well as anybody did. But I have great reservations about him as a person. He was a terrible snob. That was the worst thing. But he was also, uh, in addition to that, a person who, to my mind, treated his wife extremely badly. And when he was Lord High Commissioner of the Church of Scotland, which he reveled in and loved to dress up, um, he kept his wife firmly in the background. And I found this was almost intolerable. When I recall Reith, therefore, I recall him, if you like, warts and all. Uh, I wouldn't deny the great contribution that he made to broadcasting, but on other aspects of Reith, I recall, and I also, if you like, changed my sense of what he was like. You mean you leave some stuff out? <laughs> I've left nothing out because I'm a great believer in the integrity of history. Uh, I don't want to change the facts of history at all. Uh, I also have come to believe in chronology. And uh, chronology is terribly important. You can't write history unless you've got a very strong sense of chronology. It's fundamental. Do you think there's anything left of wreath in the BBC? Uh, there is quite a bit of stuff left in the BBC. And I've been transferring some of my papers uh, to the BBC in the last few months. And I hope there'll be open access to them in Alexandra Palace which also is another of those places which f figures in two ways in my life, not quite in three. Uh, because it was there that I gave one of the very first open university uh, broadcasts. And I, did, and I loved the great organ in Alexandra Palace, which I think is still there. Uh, I can think of no more fitting place uh, for my BBC stuff to be kept. But I do want people to have open access to it. But do you think there's anything of the ghost spirit of Reef in the 
corridors of the BBC or how it actually works and No, I don't think there's much of it. I don't think there's a ghost of no. inside the BBC no. itself. Nothing. Uh, they Nothing don't remains uh, refer to Reith. No. And uh, uh, if he's brought in at all, he's brought in when one's, they're looking at the history yeah. of the BBC. There's no ghost. Then, uh, I wish there were a ghost. So, there, so no legacy then? Uh, yes, there's still a kind of uh, element which uh, uh, Tony Hall, the present uh, Director General, uh, knows about. A really a kind of a, um, a link between Rethian values mm. uh, and contemporary broadcasting. I must admit I don't see all that much of it there myself. When I get insomnia um, <laughs> and find myself lying in the dark listening to the world's service, I feel a bit Rethian um, <laughs> because it's gone so hugely down market. Uh, it used to be a radio station of record. Now it has jingles. It sounds more like an old-fashioned American AM station with constant little pipey noises and people speaking in those seesaw tones. Sometimes you go on radio programs and the producer will come out and say, could you vary your voice a bit more? As if you're speaking to children. In fact, uh, my friend Martin Amos had a name for those kind of people. He would call them a Jack and Ori artist. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it's a very good name. It's a very good name for the kinds of presenters you now get on the World Service and one-minute items, where they, it's lost. So the, what I would think of as Rethian here, uh, leaving his wife aside for a moment, um, is this sense that actually you don't follow the crowd, you sort of lead. You have a sense of uh, value, of news value, of intellectual value, and you lay it out uncompromisingly and you say, this is a radio station of record, not of trying to please. It seems so ang riven by an anxiety not to bore and not to please. And it's sunk. It's, uh, in fact, now if, uh, it's not a cure for insomnia anymore. Um, <laughs> so I get so irritated by it. Um, <laughs> blood pressure rises and uh, better to listen to Radio 3 which broadcasts all night and actually that's Radio 3 has kept something Rethian about it it's, you know, you get well, two, you still get two hours of atonal music whether you like it or not I, <laughs> fortunately I sleep through it yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't much like it uh, but I sleep through it I, because I've fortunately been blessed by the capacity to sleep which is just as important as ah. the capacity of being awake. Ah. <laughs> I, I've lost that one. L let's um, go to another um, chapter in your book, Hazel, which is the, the, book about, uh, the chapter about science. Yes. And, um, you know, it won't pass anybody by in this room that um, Ian has always been interested in science and science penetrates a number of his, his novels. And um, some of you won't know, but Asa writes it in the book, that your best subject at school was chemistry. True. Uh, he was taught by a teacher called Fatty Acid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, knowing Asa, I think he could have made it up. But anyway, yeah. I'm going to believe it. No, I didn't make it up. <laughs> uh, the, so, point, the point was, um, at school, the subjects that you're most interested in at school are not necessarily the ones that you really deal with in the rest of your life. Uh, I found uh, uh, chemistry an absorbing subject, partly because I had a chemistry set and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I realised when I moved on to the upper echelon of the sixth form in a grammar school that uh, history was my subject. And I've never thought of anything else since. But you, you recognised that once you'd come to Sussex and after a very few years that science was going to be necessary and, and, a, and, a, and a key part of a comprehensive university. Well, I'm very glad, actually, Michael, that uh, 
I can pay tribute to the university because, in fact, I have written in some length in the book about the development of sciences at Sussex. Uh, and uh, I've gone into detail about the contributions made by individual scientists as well as the way in which the subjects themselves were related to each other. Uh, I've always been interested in Ian's interest in science, which I think is probably less involved. In, I don't know whether you had this yourself when you were at Sussex. Well, I had a polymathic education at Sussex. Um, had Quentin Bell virtually to myself um, for a course in the art and literature of Bloomsbury. But to one side was a, a seminar every week, which I attended for two years, and we called it Quantum Mechanics for Liberal Arts Know Nothings. Uh, but it probably had a more official <laughs> title. Art Science Scheme. Uh, yeah, that, we didn't like that. No, no, art Science Scheme. We didn't feel, want to feel that we were victims of a scheme. Uh, and it was fantastic. It was taught by the recently uh, deceased Brian Easley, um, who very patiently conducted us through some very difficult matters, uh, including quantum mechanics. And just coming from the university, I met uh, one of my old uh, housemates there. I hadn't seen him in almost 40 years. It's wonderful when you embrace someone and say, how was your life? <laughs> um, and we, uh, we taught, he was on this uh, scheme, um, as I must now learn to call it. And he said, and I don't remember this, he said that he said that I gave a paper to the scheme on um, the early 17th century world view, cosmology, as seen through the eyes of a quantum mechanics uh, science. Uh, I thought, I, was, I blushed when I heard this. I thought, God, how pretentious. I knew nothing about quantum mechanics. Um, not a great deal about the cosmology of John Donne and William Shakespeare. But that kind of thing was encouraged. And in fact, um, John Barrow was also there and also encouraged the humanities uh, to you know, embrace the sciences. But I still think the divide occurs. I mean, I, I listen to, it's been on my mind lately, um, hearing uh, an English literary theorist talk about Saussure's m mirror stage in children. No psychiatrist, no cognitive psychology has ever contemplated for a moment that there's a mirror stage in children because Sosa didn't observe any. He, he had no empirical basis for this. And yet it's currency in the humanities. And there are all kinds of things that relate to human nature and human sense of self that are taken for granted in the humanities because they have no sense of a scientific method. That, you know, is it true? No one ever says, is it true? And I think the divide is, is, is as big as it was in Snow's time, especially since the rise of um, postmodern theory, uh, which is now, I know, slightly uh, on the decline. <coughs> but for a long time, I felt that some of my friends, I'd lost them as if to a war. They'd gone off and got theory. Uh, and it was like waving soldiers goodbye as they got on a boat. And, uh, but some of them are coming back. Some in body bags, some walking wounded. <laughs> Ian, you, you said, uh, I think in an interview, something is missing in our culture. We can't quite celebrate the scientific literary tradition. We overvalue the arts in relation to the sciences. What did you mean by that? What I meant was that because science is always concerned with being right, it tends to ignore the great glories of being wrong. And... There's a lot of science that cannot happen, could not happen, without other people being wrong. And there's a fabulous tradition, if only it could be properly claimed, of scientific writing, which would run probably from Aristotle right through uh, you know, uh, Bacon, um, 
Thomas Brown, uh, through the early you know, micrography of, of Hooke, all the way through the 18th, 19th centuries, and then, of course, the great um, writings of Huxley and Darwin and Wallace, but also Schrodinger, uh, What is Life, those great Dublin lectures. You have actually now an extraordinary tradition, a, a library, as it were, and something is missing from the scientific education, that it doesn't value its past. It's, own, it's as if science is just a little pencil beam of light in darkness moving through time, advancing on the darkness, but leaving darkness behind. And whereas with <coughs> literature, we can celebrate the past. We, we live with, we can constantly, we feel like, as Jan Cott, that famous book, Shakespeare is our contemporary. Uh, we constantly reinterpret and bring him back into our lives and all of literature, even the worst of it, is, is available for study. But the scientists ignore their traditions. They don't celebrate France, the Bacons uh, of this world. Uh, the great writing, the, the wonderful letters sent to, by Wigons to the Royal Society about first looking at pond water or, miraculously, his own semen through a microscope. Uh, these are brilliant. I mean, it's like someone arriving on a new planet. Uh, so that was what, it was a plea, actually, to the scientists to be more like uh, the humanities and, well, I, and I think, love their past. I think, Ian, that to some extent you haven't got that quite right because, to my mind, the history of science is one of the most important bits of work being done in universities now. Uh, and, uh, uh, for example, uh, when I was doing uh, the work for this book, uh, I found that the person who was helping me uh, is in involved in the great Newton project. Mm. Uh, and the Newton project is really to look at Newton from every angle and to collect all the information possible, and also all the interpretations that are being given to his work. And the history of science involves fundamental revisions and fundamental re-evaluations. But do you think the scientists are reading the history of oh, science? Oh, yes, I do. Do you? Oh, well, then, I, and, for example, I'm... Schrodinger uh, is a person who has always interested me, uh, but I also think that uh, scientists at Sussex are quite interested in the way in which the sciences developed there, which is one of the chapters in my book. And I quite deliberately did that because I felt if I didn't do that, nobody would. Ah, well, uh, you, you sort of make that point. But uh, <laughs> without you, um, well, I'm, I'm relieved to hear that because I... It's not part of a science degree to do the history of science in most places. Maybe it is in Sussex. Um, no one's required. So, I mean, I, I think that we ought to celebrate more um, ways of being wrong. Yes. I mean, um, it's sometimes necessary to be wrong in, in order for others to be right. Uh, and actually, someone who wastes a year exploring an avenue at least closes it off for everybody else. They don't have to plunge down it too. Yes, I, I'm interested, as you are, in what is wrong. Wrong, wrong is. Uh, and I'm subject. fascinated by the fact that uh, uh, many people today, when they use a phrase like history shows, which I detest, mm -hmm. don't realize that they're talking about historians and that some of them were wrong. Mm. Uh, and I don't think history shows anything. I think historians do, but some of them were wrong. And I'm glad to feel that historians can be as wrong as scientists. But I, I think the fundamental principle in the scientific method is that there is no right or wrong. You ask a question honestly and openly and don't know whether it, the answer is going to be the one you think it would be or could be something different. So true. the scientific true. method is, is, it doesn't predicate whether it's going to likely to be wrong or right. Can I ask you, Ian, just one question? I mean, you've covered um, 
uh, climate change in, in one of your books. Um, you've covered um, neurosurgery in Saturday. What led you towards erotomania in Enduring Love? Uh, that sounds like a leading question. Um, <laughs> no, there's a cor corollary coming right. out. Okay. <laughs> well, um, the literature in erotomania, which I stumbled on by accident, uh, believe me. Um, <laughs> so when you were um, listening to Radio 4, th one, th No, 3. <laughs> 3, 3, sorry. <laughs> Atonal music. And, um, <laughs> It, it seemed that uh, psychiatric patients who were delusional, suffering from what the French called um, de Clermont syndrome, what now in the um, DSM, the American Manual, um, calls erotomania, uh, was simply something that lay at the far end of spectrum, spectrum of something that we celebrate as the most valuable experience of adult life, which is to fall in love fall in love and find that all your thoughts are focused on the object of your love, to be able to think of nothing else, maybe to lose your appetite. I mean, there's a vast and wonderful uh, literary tradition of, of uh, in poetry, uh, especially uh, of the business of falling in love. Um, and uh, actually, the novel is very good at falling out of love. And partly, I think, the novels are very good at tracking people through time, whereas poetry catches the moment and celebrates it uh, very, uh, in a way maybe the novel can't. And I thought how interesting that this is just a turn of the screw, as it were, on something that we value. Um, and reading the, the psychiatric case histories of, uh, basically they're stalkers, and they can ruin lives with their obsessions, and they are also delusional. I mean, they're, they're, they're psychotic. But they are people, mostly men actually, but quite a few women, uh, people in love. So I you know, read a case of uh, some marvellous moments of subjectivity in this. Um, for example, a woman who fell in love with her local vicar um, and pestered him and drove him mad. And finally, uh, she was offered, and I love this in the literature, it's called um, gently challenging therapy. Um, <laughs> Very sinister. <coughs> um, and uh, five milligrams of pimazide uh, daily. Um, up until that point, she was reporting hearing the vicar communicate to her by the phone, even when the phone was in its cradle. And he communicated to her his love. And this is the other tangled thing about erotomania. The sufferer thinks it's the other person, the object they love, who's fallen in love with them, and they're simply having to finally reluctantly return this love. So the vicar was calling this woman through the phone with a series of high-pitched bleeps. Uh, and she said that, you know, finally she'd fallen in love with him, it wasn't her fault, but he had pestered her, and now she was hopelessly in love with him. After six months of five milligrams of pimazide and gently channeling therapy, uh, she was asked how things were with the vicar, and she said, I think he's getting over it. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it's those kinds of stories that you get in psychiatric papers which are bound to be of interest to the novelist, that, um, the power of a subjective world to completely frame your sense of what's real uh, is, to me, endlessly fascinating. So, some of you may recall that Ian got himself slightly into hot water over this one because he wrote up a case history, completely fabricated, sent it off to a medical journal, and it was almost accepted for publication. Uh, uh, I'd say, and if I'd done that, I might have get struck off by the GMC for gross misconduct. <laughs> yes, it was the Yellow Book, uh, a very venerable journal, and um, I got so involved in the language of psychiatry, I thought, well, I'll stick it in my end of my novel as an appendix, as a fake um, recounting of the whole novel through the eyes of a psychiatrist. And I made an anagram of my name, two, two doctors, Wen and Camille. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and as soon as I put it in the post, I thought, oh, I've done a terrible thing. Um, what if they accept it? Um, I don't want them to look like fools. Um, 
I don't want to seem like a brute. Uh, it's not a parody. It was a serious piece. I got, a, I got a letter back immediately saying, we aim to accept or reject all submissions within four weeks. Now, yeah. if you live in the literary world where you send off short stories, you might not hear anything for two years. So <laughs> I was already impressed. Then, and within the time frame, a letter came back and said, we read it with great interest. Uh, unfortunately, for you that is, um, we can no longer accept case studies with a sample of one. <laughs> so I thought, well, there goes the wolf man, all of Freud. You know, yes. um, <laughs> quite right. So they said, with a, we would accept a minimum sample of 24. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, it's just taken me two years to do this <laughs> one person. Uh, and thank God for, for very sound me uh, reasons of scientific method. Um, how dare you draw, draw conclusions from one patient? So Mary Barnes, I mean, all those things that have shaped our knowledge of, uh, so-called knowledge of uh, how the human mind works. It's useless. Uh, the Wolfman and Anna O, oh, another case of Freud's. There by the um, grace of God. Yes. yes. Let, let me just um, turn you towards another very important um, theme that runs through all three of your, your books, which is, of course, intelligence services, espionage, codes. Um, and, of course, it's something that Ian's last Ian's book... Ian's very much interested Ian's in. Ian's yeah. extremely interested in, and it was a dominant theme in, um, in Sweet Tooth. Yes. Sweet Tooth, I found very interesting, of course, because it is about Sussex, but it's very much a contrived story. Uh, and uh, I was never entirely taken in by it. Oh, oh well. come on, Asa. <laughs> I'd also like to say... You mean you think it didn't happen? No, he guessed the ending. He guessed the ending. I guessed the ending. <laughs> uh, oh. But I should say this much, Someone that... Told that's very important to be able to get an ending. Uh, it's more difficult to get the beginning. Um, but if I can just say, uh, uh, in reply to one thing Ian said, one reason why I could not really write a novel is because I wouldn't want to write about love. I've got two reasons for feeling that I don't be, be able to write a novel. One is... I couldn't get the conversations right. And secondly, I feel that uh, I would have to get a subject which really gripped me. Why not? And I haven't thought of one yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was going to ask Michael myself and also Ian, uh, the first chapter of my new book is I think in threes trilogy is one aspect of it but all kinds of other ways I think in threes now I wondered whether Ian would say ever say that you would think in threes I think it's very tempting to think in threes sometimes you have to resist for example composing a sentence often impels you Yes. To, it was this, this, and that. Um, and it can sometimes rob the sentence of any conviction simply because it seems formulaic. So it's better to sometimes push for two or four because no one will believe your three, that yes. they've fallen into a slot. But I think it, it's true. The, the syllogism is clearly yes. uh, there. Uh, and yet Shakespeare's plays are in five acts, not three. Um, most plays are in two, not three. Uh, I think it's very powerful, though, the three. Uh, three adjectives, something, something, and something, <laughs> is, I think, a rhetorical mistake. But I understand the pull of it. Yes. But you mean much larger intellectual Well, for example, I mean just simple words. For example, BBC. Uh, yeah, you sound like the World Service. ARP. <laughs> <laughs> ARP. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how many things really are dealt with in trees. You quoted, Michael, at the beginning, a thing from a previous book. But I don't think I realised then how much I do think in trees mm. until I started writing this book. 
uh, this new book, and it says interesting things about trees, and they are sometimes calls to action. Yeah. One of the, when you're talking about an aspect of Bletchley in this last book, you also talk about propaganda. Yes. The Ministry of Propaganda. And you talk about France as being the best place in the world to talk and write about propaganda. Yes. I, I don't remember that coming out so strongly in the first book about Bletchley. And I, I just wonder, um, you, you describe a situation where they got a bunch of writers together in the First World War to, to drive the propaganda machine. So Ian would be recruited out of uniform, presumably, yes. to well, write good stuff, to get the good best stories about the Great War out to, to the people. Well, fortunately, so I wonder how you know you, as somebody in the um, intelligence services, and Ian as a potential writer to be recruited yes. in to help. Um... Well, I was interested in propaganda uh, before I went to uh, Bletchley, uh, and I knew the work that was being done at Woburn Sands on propaganda, and. Uh, I thought that I might be involved in this kind of intelligence activity myself. Uh, I'm glad that I, instead I moved towards code breaking, which I found fascinating. Uh, but I've changed my views quite a bit on Bletchley since I wrote the first book in this trilogy. Therefore, uh, I think that the Three books together are interconnected, but that um, one should be allowed to change one's mind about books which one has written fairly recently. <laughs> yeah. and obviously, propaganda was a, was an important theme in Sweet Tooth. Tom Haley was the the subject. Well, I discovered this uh, little byline of contemporary history called. Uh, under the rubric of the cultural Cold War. Yes. Um, really quite an extraordinary chapter in our recent history, really mostly starting in the, in the United States with the CIA, which was staffed at the time by a lot of Harvard professors um, who had very good taste and a good cultural reach. And they set about it's hardly propaganda. What they did was find either ex-communists or democratic socialists, or what they called um, the anti-communist left, who, who were always going to write what they were going to write anyway, but they tried to give them a wider um, distribution. So, for example, Orwell's uh, Animal Farm in 1984 uh, were taken up by a department of the Foreign Office called a secret department called the Information Research Department and translated into languages all across for, for Eastern Europe and, and, and for the Soviet Union. So no one was actually saying or thinking anything differently. The anti-totalitarian left seemed like to uh, the top of the CIA uh, their best allies in the fight <laughs> against uh, the, the ideological struggle against, against the Soviet Union. So that when the McCarthy period came around, interestingly, a number of CIA officers were up before the committee for their extensive connections with the European left. Uh, and, and some lost their jobs. The general purpose was to try and woo uh, mostly continental Europe. The, the Communist Party in Italy and France was still quite strong. Um, not much less so here. But there was still a large body of opinion who had a, a sort of uh, uh, <coughs> plague on both your houses attitude to Soviet Union on one side, America on the other. Uh, that was a standard view. And the idea was to persuade them that Western culture was more open, freer, better, livelier. So the CIA funded a festival of contemporary music in Paris in 1950, with huge success. They ran a magazine Encounter, they funded that through the Congress of Cultural Freedom, uh, a superb German magazine called Der Monat. And this was the trouble. The, these magazines were rather good. I mean, <laughs> um, when, it, 
when they were busted in 1967, big piece in the New York Times, uh, there was a huge stink and Stephen Spender was very upset. You mm. probably remember this better than, than I do. Uh, but still Encounter went on for another uh, 15 years um, and I was very pleased to publish in it. I mean, it was, it was a very good magazine. So it, it, it was an odd matter. It wasn't simply a matter of writing uh, cooked up stories for propaganda purposes. It was getting the kind of people who would say the kinds of things that you th thought were helpful to your side. But there are some historians who think actually the anti-communist left uh, in uh, France and Britain were the ones who were using the CIA to, uh, to get their own message across. They didn't care who the money came from. Um, so uh, propaganda can be much more than just you know telling um, special kinds of useful lies to, to, to disrupt the enemy. And so Sweet Tooth very much came out of historical reading yeah. Yeah. Of, a, of, a, of a, quite a burgeoning uh, corner of, of uh, contemporary history. I thought uh, Encounter was really a wonderful uh, magazine, whatever its origins, uh, and I wrote quite a lot in it myself. Yeah. Um, How did you feel when you found out it was the CIA <laughs> funding? Well, I, I didn't really too much bother to tell you the truth because uh, it, that was a long time later. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, I found that the material in uh, Sweet Tooth about uh, propaganda and intelligence was very true. Uh, I believe, however, that we're living in a world now where there's more propaganda than we've had for a very long time. And uh, it's one reason why I don't particularly like to listen to the news. I think there's a tremendous amount of propaganda in the news. John Snow is here, so he I know <laughs> the, I know the, uh, and John, I'm sure, might agree with me on that. Uh, that um, I do. Yes. <laughs> well, we're coming towards the end, but I'm sure there are um, many questions um, out there, and I think we should give um, people an opportunity just to um, apply you a little harder. So um, microphones are around and circulating. Please put up a hand and we'll get a microphone to you very quickly. And if you just say who you are and, and ask your question. Short questions, we'll get through more if they're short rather than long. Um, a qu question uh, for Lord Briggs. Uh, you, you said that um, when you're writing history, that sometimes it feels like novel writing. Mm. And I wondered if you feel that being imaginatively caught up can sometimes lead interpretation astray, and whether you've ever had that experience yourself. I think that um, uh, I have really felt myself that at times. Uh, I believe that um, uh, interpretation is a fundamental part of all history writing, which in a sense is about interpretation. So I agree with the, what lay behind the question, I think. John. I wonder, Asa, whether you're thinking of Ukraine when you think about American propaganda. It seems to be a, a, a situation which has been fabulously badly handled by the West, and in particular, uh, the United States.
Yes, I think uh, it is uh, American propaganda, largely, that I was thinking of. Uh, I think the world that we see certain aspects of our contemporary life in the wrong terms. For example, I don't agree with much that's been said at present about Russia. Uh, and uh, I thought it was extremely interesting to put together an item of news that the Crimea had been uh, a very old news, in which, which it's printed in the Telegraph, uh, that the Crimea had been recaptured. Uh, I find that um, I believe that we are misinterpreting many aspects of Russian uh, history, uh, and also I don't have very much sympathy with Putin, but I think that the aspects of Russian history which would enable us, we would understand better if we really knew more about the history of Russia. One of the well, things... Could I, could I just add something? I've, I've just come back from Moscow from a um, seminar run by a very brave band of uh, Russian intellectuals, historians, and writers uh, called uh, the Moscow School for Civic Dialogue. Now, they've been going quite a few years now, and they are broadband politically, but they speak mostly for a civil society, uh, freedom of expression, free and open journalism, and they are deeply depressed, actually. They feel fantastically beleaguered. And uh, one of the speakers there, and we got to know him very well, was the man who founded the organization called Memorial, which yeah. began in 87 during the perestroika days. And he said, well, we have tried to keep alive any notion of the Russian, the so dead to the Soviet Union, uh, to the camps, uh, to the famine, the deliberately manufactured famine in Ukraine and so on. And he says, I have to admit, I put my hand on my heart, we have failed. Millions, 15, 18, 20 million dead, we won't know. Uh, there is not a single plaque, there's not a memorial, there isn't a museum, there is nothing. And I have to say that I think this is a very dark moment in Russia. And uh, blaming the Americans for it, I think, is to miss the point profoundly. Russian intellectuals really, uh, of that persuasion, really do need us to reach out to them and say, actually, the, the darkness is not you know, total. Um, I think it's a, a matter of huge concern. They feel this space, they, they point to the number of journalists who've been murdered, the closing down of independent TV stations, which should be of great interest to you, John, um, and the general shrinking of the possibilities of freedom of expression in Russia are really alarming. So I, I would not take this view that this is all America's fault or something. I really think that we are in a very dark and strange new time which is going to have massive effects internationally. One, one of the things you say in the book, Aza, is that you, you, you lament the fact that um, many politicians, indeed you, you talk about our politicians, um, have so little interest or knowledge of history? Well, they not only have no knowledge, but they also don't care that they <laughs> don't have any knowledge. And that's what worries me most. Uh, I think a, a deeper sense of history on the part of politicians would give us all hope for the future. Question over there at the back. Uh, so, Ian McEwen, Ian, um, you said that there's a great tradition of science writing that needs to be claimed. Um, and you sort of suggested that it's the scientists who are not claiming their tradition. But because you don't have to read Darwin to, as, you, as a student to understand evolution or Schrodinger for quantum mechanics, is it perhaps the job of the writers and humanists, you know, people like Richard Holmes writing The Age of Wonder, that this is the opportunity for 
for writers, for humanists, to, to tell those stories of science, because the scientists are always at the frontier, moving on, not, not, not reliving that tradition. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. My, my plea really was that it would be nice if it was mandatory for all those doing the sciences to do a bit of history of science, which, are, you know, Ace is absolutely right, is a great and burgeoning and growing subject. But the, the scientists tend to live in a perpetual present. That's my sense of things. And they've got a very honorable past. Uh, if we can reclaim it for we being in the humanities can reclaim it, that's great. But they need to uh, be part of it. I mean, to, and, and I think undergraduate level is the moment, or maybe even A level, I don't think. Phyllis, welcome back to Charleston. P.D. James. It's lovely to be back. It really is lovely to be back. And I've seen so many differences. It's extended, and it's made even more exciting than it was. Well, this is my question. I'm thinking of the John Chilcott inquiry about the Iraq war. Yes. It's four years late, and nothing is done. And this is a method we seem to use when there's any great controversy, any great war, setting up a committee of the great and the good on the whole, with us rather high regarded as chairman. Does this do anything for any of us? Would it be better if you had a group of historians to look at things and try to arrive at the truth? Or is this just a poor way of keeping the public quiet for a few years? Who'd like to tackle that? Well, I, I, I entirely agree that it seems to me to be disgraceful that the Chilcot uh, inquiry has not so far been published after a very long period of time. And I use the word disgraceful, but I'm not sure that we would have done much better if we'd had a group of professional historians working. Uh, one of them, in fact, is quite a good, on that, that group, is a very good historian. Uh, and uh, I think that they, I, I just disapprove of really pretending that there's something secret in what they've been writing about. I would guess it's American pressure, wouldn't you, that is stopping the release of uh, the flow of information between Blair and Bush? Uh, well, that's a different matter, I think. Question on the <coughs> left. It's just another question about um, the relationship between science and history. And I found myself thinking, as you were talking about the chill that sometimes seems to exist between science and philosophy, Richard Feynman once commented that um, he needed a philosopher like a bird needed an ornithologist, which may be proof that great minds can be wrong. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts about this distance between science and its history and this chill between science and philosophy as well. Ian? I think science is, uh, sorry, philosophy has had um, a shot in the arm from, from the biological sciences in the last 20 years. Philosophy got incredibly boring, you know, on matters of when you say green and I say green, are we talking about the same thing? Um, round and round and round, or brain on a plate discussions. Um, and uh, I think the, the philosopher who I think has broken out and brought many with him and become much more available to a general public has been Daniel Dennett, whose philosophy is much informed by cognitive psychology and, and neuroscience and trying to bring philosophy back to some kind of empirical basis. Um, and then from that, speculate about what might be, I mean, what, of what we are. So I think philosophy has got interesting again. And, and so, I'm quite happy about that. <coughs> Any other final questions? Well, uh, well, I've got one. I can't resist asking you both, and it, this will be a short answer yeah. rather than an essay. Um, <laughs> you, in, you know, um, you overlapped at the University of Sussex almost 50 years ago now. Coming up. I, I'm sorry to say that, Ian, but it's just true. <laughs> and I just wonder, you were at Sussex probably at almost the most exciting time in its 
history and evolution. And I just wonder, without wanting you to go back and, and, and um, indulge yourself in those wonderful times, I'd like just to think forward and wonder whether you think we're going in the right direction or do you think we've lost our way? Well, I'll go first so Asa can have the last word. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I was just the recipient of, of something that Asa had in mind, which was a redrawn map of learning, and uh, it's, um, I felt uh, nourished by it all my life. Uh, I, but I was lucky. There were only 3,000 students there, and all the teaching was on a tutorial basis, one on two, and I'm very sad that's lost. On the other hand, I don't know how you do that if you've got 20,000 undergraduates to, to teach. Uh, I don't know how you square that circle. Certainly being back there this afternoon in ideal conditions, the, the lawns covered in daisies and buttercups and aquilegia, uh, it looked great. Um, Especially for you, Yeah, uh, uh, and, and very nice tea in the sunshine. Uh, the students looking sort of and speaking in lively terms, uh, it was hard not to feel this is a, some sort of paradise that you made. Uh, and got, I can only congratulate you. You've got the right answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Asa, tell the truth. I never do anything but tell the truth. But all I would say is that um, I think that the emphasis of the university now on looking forward is the right emphasis. And I think that is probably true for all of us, that we've got to look forward rather than to spend all our time looking back. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure you would all like me to um, uh, thank both Ian and Asa for a wonderful session. Um, we were absolutely on pain of death told not to mention Ian's forthcoming book. <laughs> Um, and I've obeyed all the rules that Diana set me, so I think we, we've done well there. Um, next year's a very special... So, September, um, the Children Act, and, and Ian will be talking about it, I think, tomorrow. Um, AIDS has got a very special year next year. Um, uh, 2015 is his 60th wed wedding anniversary with Susan. And so we're all looking forward to celebrating that with you, Asa. It's also the centenary, or the whatever centenary it is, of Magna Carta. And I, Excellent. I'm glad to know that the two coincide. So we're looking forward to another very good year next year. Thank you both. <laughs>